Okay guys, as I mentioned, um, this little speaker on here is not very loud at all. Uh, so it's pretty useless in the field. Um, when I'm recording on a film set, uh, and even sometimes in a bar or a restaurant or a club, I want to listen back, uh, or, or video shoot, I want to listen back to see how the take went. And listening to it, especially with other people in a loud environment or outside when it's windy and noisy and street traffic, you can't hear that little speaker. So uh, what you want to do is plug in some good quality field headphones. These are some new uh, headphones that I just got. They're a lot like the Sony's that I usually use, but I like them uh, very much. They're, they, they feel good. Uh, so uh, when you're in the field, uh, plugging in some headphones is essential to hear your work. You can't use that uh, internal, that external, that little internal speaker is just not going to cut it. You need a good quality pair of headphones like this to monitor your boom or to monitor your lav microphones or for recording to listening to your uh, inputs from your front mics or whatever you're using. You want to listen in there and don't rely on that little headphone. Uh, it's good for playback. Obviously, you can listen back uh, using your the controls I described earlier to listen to your files. In addition to these headphones, uh, they're a little bit, they're comfortable, but they're a little bit clunky. You've got this cord to worry about. Um, I found that if I'm using a camera, uh, it's one more cord that's kind of getting in the way. So often, uh, if I'm doing camera work, I won't use a, I won't use a pair of uh, a professional headphones like that. I want something lightweight and out of the way and easy to uh, kind of just hang around my neck. Um, just a pair of earbuds is great. You can plug those in, have those in your ear, and you're communicating a lot. You're, you know, you're, they're not as obtrusive. You're, you're checking your audio, but you can still hear clearly the sur people talking in your surrounding environment. But that way you can kind of hear that the microphones are on. You're going to hear if there's any loud noises or line noise or anything like that. Uh, it's just a kind of a quick way to a spot check your audio uh, and still talk to your talent or uh, your director. Um, but if you're doing something more professional, you want to use a good pair of headphones. So... Plugging these in, I often use Sony headphones. Uh, they're available on Amazon, pretty cheap. Uh, these are nice as well. The problem with these, although they're great for uh, monitoring your audio, they kind of close off the outside world a little bit. Not too much, you can still hear, but uh, they're, um, you're not able to share this with another person. So if somebody comes up and says, I want to hear playback on that, you have to take your headphones off and hand them to them. Uh, that was a problem during COVID, um, handing around headphones. You couldn't really do that. So what I did was I got a little splitter, a little headphone splitter cable uh, that I just kind of had in there all the time in my sound bag. And I was plugged into one side. And then I had a second pair of headphones with a really long cord. And so uh, if another, if the producer came up and wanted to hear a playback, I could give them a second pair of headphones and we could both listen uh, to that source at the same time. Or if my uh, uh, assistant sound man would come up and we could, we could both listen back to something at the same time and talk about it. So that's something you might want to do. Um, if you're not going to do that though, and you want to do something for a group of people, uh, what you need to do is get some external speakers going. And... I have uh, these little guys right here. Uh, these are just some little Bluetooth speakers that I picked up. Um, they sound great. They've got a nice little bass response to them. Uh, they're very portable and durable. They're Bluetooth speakers. I'm not using them as Bluetooth speakers in this particular situation. I'm just going to use them as a um, pair of attachable speakers. So at the very least, you want to get a cord like this. This is just a little... Uh, 3.5 millimeter stereo cord that you can plug into the, I recommend plugging it into the uh, headphone output and then plug it into the, actually first you turn it on, a little blue light comes on and you reveal this flap right here, that's where you recharge it and you stick that in there. Let's go to a file. Yeah, you know, you're just coming up like this. Okay, no, there no, you can no, hear. Just, right? just say it. And then if okay. you hear them talk, you And you have control over the volume here, which is nice about using the headphone jack. Okay. Okay, if you plug it into the external line out. It's still coming out your headphones. When 
you don't, so don't use the external line out. Use the headphones out, and that way more than one person oh, can hear card in your pocket. Card in your pocket. the playback, and you can turn it down or up. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the one. However much you need. If you just need a quick, quiet little playback, you can do it like that, or you can turn it up plenty loud. Okay. You can hand that to people. It's like a noise environment. It's a lot better way to get a playback going. It's a little Bluetooth speaker. You don't have to use these little guys, obviously. You can use big JBLs or whatever you've got. Uh, but you got to have something like that. And I don't recommend don't trying to get a Bluetooth link going. It's just one more little confusing thing you've got to do to make sure you've got a Bluetooth established. Just get the little wire and keep it in your pack. And there you go. If you wanted to, and like I said, you can skip between files quickly like that. Jonah, we're at 1.8 ND, you know? Much quicker way to play back Action. your sounds instead of going into that browser. Don't go in there, guys. It's just much better here. Get used to using the stop and the play buttons on your unit and then using the skip buttons here. Rolling. Roll it. It would be super nice if you could scrub yeah. using this wheel, but you can't. Another thing you can do, oh, by the way, that's going to show you there that it's playing back that third track. It was just the boom I had on three. I wasn't using any there lobs there. Set. It's just showing you there by that you little in green indicator that that's the channel that's playing back, okay? If you want to do something a little more elaborate, get yourself a different chord. This is uh, just to listen back in mono. I think it's combining a stereo signal onto a mono source is what it's actually doing there. But let me show you another thing you can do with a cable like this one. Something I picked up again on my favorite company, Amazon. This is just a few bucks. I think it was like eight or nine dollars. It's a stereo out in the headphones. And as you can see, it's very nice brass construction. It's real solid. It's about three, two or three feet long. And it goes to, and this is important, it goes to two mono plugs, not stereo plugs. Otherwise, it won't work. But you, it's a left and the right. Uh, and you can plug the left side into your if you have two of these speakers, plug it into that side and plug in your right side into the other speaker. Turn that speaker on. Now you've got a nice little stereo playback. Much better. Ready? Action. So if you had music, uh, if you wanted to have a stereo playback, you could do that. If you were doing any kind of a little mix to send off to your producer that day that's baked into the files that you're sending them, if you wanted to try to deal with something like that, you can go into okay. the mixer menu sure. I'm gonna get these, I'm gonna get these shots and start doing your blending right there from all your different booms, your tracks. Uh, not something I recommend doing is trying to do a little mix right there on the fly, but you certainly could. Uh, the other thing you can do is go into those windows and adjust the panning. So if you wanted to start panning out your stereo Im image, that will show up here on your stereo speakers. But again, not something I really recommend trying to do in the field. Um, just hand over the audio files and they're gonna take it back to their studio and do a little mix there. Uh, or you can do that at home for your producer, but if you're trying to hand off a file that day to the producer, uh, it's gonna put you under a lot of pressure to try to do it here you know, out, out in the field. Um, so I wouldn't recommend trying to, trying to mix on the fly like that. So that's a nice little way that you can output to a pair of speakers like that and get a nice stereo image for stereo playback. I'm just gonna leave that on for a second and get that out of the way. I think for the sake of demonstration, I'm just gonna keep on using this external speaker for some volume. You can use a shorter cable like this if you want. It's a really quick and easy setup like that. Very portable. Rolling. Rolling. Oops, wrong jack. Okay. I'm gonna come over and touch the battery. And okay. The on. There you go. So am I okay? So when you're handing off your files, there's a couple ways you can do it. At the end of the day, um, 
some producers will come up and want to know if they can have the chip. And you can do that uh, if you've got a backup chip or if they provided you with a little, little chip that you recorded to. Uh, that's kind of problematic because that's the only copy. Uh, what I prefer to do instead of handing the producer that chip and hoping they don't lose it uh, is um, explain that I'll get it to them right away. And that gives me the ability to go home, uh, take the chip out of my Tascam, put it in my computer, upload the audio files, and make a backup copy. That's the first thing I do before I start doing anything else, make a backup of that audio. I might even back it up twice to do two different drives if it's an important project. And uh, that way uh, I can then upload the files to a Dropbox or a Google Drive or something like that and send my producer a link to that and they can download it. Uh, if you can do that the same evening, that's really nice. Uh, if they can go home that night and say, expect it within a few hours and then get that file right away, they're like, oh, this guy's on, on the ball. Or certainly by the next morning, if you can do that night and have it ready for them the next morning when they wake up, they can audition to check out your files. Instead of trying to hand them your chip, I don't recommend that. There are devices that have two chips, one for you and one to hand off, um, but this one doesn't. So be careful with that chip. There's a lot of valuable information on there. It, it all sits on a little teeny uh, SD microchip. When you're handing out those files to your producer or to your editor, whoever's in charge of those sound files and is going to be mixing it, it might be necessary, depending on their level of experience, for you to explain a couple of things. One is about 32-bit float. Well, if they're not expecting a 32-bit float file or know what that is, uh, it might be confusing to them. Those files might not play uh, immediately on a laptop. However, if you load them up into your editor, like a DaVinci or Final Cut Pro or uh, anything like that, those, appli those applications will be able to play 32-bit 32 32 float back. But if, if they're confused and they can't, they're you know, on their computer trying to get them to play and they're not in their editor yet, um, they won't play. So that's something you need to explain to them. Also explain to them the whole point of handing off 32-bit files, that if they get a peak, a loud spot, in their, and it looks or appears to be distorting, uh, uh, they can grab that line and just drag it down in post, and that preserved audio will become apparent. If they don't know about 32-bit float, you kind of need to explain that to them a little bit so that they can say, oh, I thought it was distorting. This is great. I can just pull it back. It's all great. Or if, the, if it's a really soft spot, they can just grab that editing line and pull up the audio and boom, it's all at a good level. So explain those little features to them so that they understand 32-bit float. The other thing you're gonna have to explain is the, uh, the way that the files are, are coming out. Um, the way it works with Tascam files uh, is you're gonna get a big long list of files and it's gonna say, I think the first thing you see is uh, the, the different tracks. So you're gonna have uh, a track one, two, three, four, five, and six, your six audio tracks. Uh, right there from all your different microphones. Um, you'll have to explain to them that the boom is always on one if you've set it up that way or the boom the boom and the three lobs are always on three, four, five, and six. However you want to do that, just give them a little note so they know what to expect. Uh, and then on channels seven and eight is going to be the mix track, okay? That's the little mix down that this thing automatically makes uh, as you're recording onto that seventh and eighth track, which um, may be useless to them. I mean, they're more likely to need the individual tracks and they're gonna create a little bit of a mix. But if they just wanna kinda of get an overall picture of the entire uh, day, they can listen to that track seven, eight mix track and um, get, get that picture. But I always just leave my mixer set up so that everything's centered and mono with all the volume levels at the same. So you're not really mixing, you're just giving them kind of a combination of all your tracks onto one little thing. I usually just tell those, Tell them to ignore that 7th and 8th track. I sure wish Tascam had just given us uh, two more tracks to record on instead of using those for a mix file. I get what they're trying to do, being professional, for, but it would be so nice if this was an 8-track recorder. It has 8 tracks, you're just not able to access them. Even if it didn't have any more uh, microphone inputs, uh, if it just had 7 and 8th you record you know, ambient sound to or an external mic, that would be super nice instead of messing around with that little mixer that they give you here. Anyway, so explain that to your, your people when you're handing off the files, what to expect and how to handle it. And I think that they're gonna be really happy when they get those files and they hear how great the quality is and that ability to recover uh, uh, distorted or low audio with that 32-bit float. It's one of the main reasons I bought the unit. So share the wealth. This is a simple little cable. Uh, it's for RCA connection. Um, this is the same. Uh, uh, 
three and a half millimeter output from your headphone jack, or you could plug it from your line out, in this case, unpowered line out. That goes to a RCA cable like this right here. A lot of people don't know what these are anymore. So you take a left and right RCA cable and then the other end can go to your mixer. There's a third line there for video, but that's not what we're doing here. So you've got RCA output and you can plug that into your uh, uh, PA system, oh, in, into another recorder, anything that requires a, a non-powered line out level, you can do that. You can also add quarter inch adapters to this if you wanted to plug into quarter inch. Okay, so that's that little thing. Again, a little cable saves the day. These three little guys, some of these are some of the cables you're definitely gonna need. That, that. These two are the same, just different lengths. This one stretches. This one splits into a, like I showed you, that splits into a uh, two monos. So that's kind of similar to that. And then also you get a longer version like that. Four cables basically just that you're gonna need. Don't forget some RCA cables if you need them and some XL, some quarter inch adapters if you need those. There's one little more little guy that you might wanna pick up. These come in handy and you might have seen them before. This is a little adapter. Uh, this is an XLR adapter from the 3.5 millimeter. Okay, and that simply plugs in. Oops, that's a male unit that simply plugs into your unit like that. And then you can plug in a source from a 3.5 straight into it. That could be from a uh, uh, Rode microphone like the one I have in my video camera right here. You could plug straight in without, or you could do uh, uh, anything that plugs into a 3.5. It converts it so you're able to use your XLR input. The problem with these is they're not cheap. I believe these are about 20 bucks each. I don't like spending, I don't want to spend $80 on XLR in, uh, converters for four microphones. I just don't want to do that. So I'm about to show you another way that you can avoid using these for inputs like that because as any, anybody that's used the Rode device knows that that's the output that the it's a 3.5 output and you want to plug that into you want to plug your lobs into your tracks right but to do that you would need to do that and even then for the newer road units uh, that's not a, that's a stereo output it's not a mono output so that doesn't work okay it's a problem that I came up against working in the field I wanted to have four different lobs going in individually, four mono lava, lava layers going into um, those tracks. So what I did was purchase these guys, and these are available, I found these on Amazon. Again, it was a little tricky to find just the ones I liked. I knew they were out there, but I didn't know where to find them, but I, I did find them. These are from a company called Cable Matters. Uh, they are very well made, uh, brass, and hard plastic. Uh, they're real solid. They're not long, so they don't take up a whole lot of space. And what these do is they split the output from a device like uh, uh, the Rode, which is a two lobs are transmitted from the lavaliers. I've got them labeled five and six in this case, coming back to your transmitter. Uh, on the first Rodes, they were, it was a mono unit, so it was one came to one, but the new uh, wireless Go 2s uh, came out a few years ago, and that allows you to do the same thing, but with uh, two microphones. It cost $100 more, uh, but I got that, uh, obviously, because I wanted to have two lobs. Um, I won't go into the new Rhodes, the wireless uh, Pros. They've got some kind of uh, time code built into them. I'm looking at those because uh, I'm seriously considering about how I want to use time code in the future, but I'm not going to go into that right now. Uh, the Rode microphones transmit back to the uh, receiver and then the output from the receiver uh, you want to plug in there. How are you gonna do that? There's no, I tried plugging it into the uh, external line input. That wasn't working for me. So I got these guys. And what that is, is it takes that jack, 3.5 stereo and splits it to two 
quarter inch monos. And then you simply plug those straight in like that. Boom. Okay. It's taking these two guys, five and six, to the transmitter wirelessly. And then, boom, straight into your mixer. And if I turn these on real quick, let me turn on my receiver first and my two microphones. Power those guys up, boom and boom. You can see I've got signal right there. I think I have this in report pause. Let me see. General settings. Recording settings. Yes, sir. There, see, it slipped me up. Record pause I left on. Let me turn that off and never turn it on ever again in my future. Now let's go back to the, uh, there we go. You see, everything was working fine and I, I couldn't see any levels. That's because that record pause was on. You can see where that would slip you up. So with that turned off, I can now see, uh, what I'm seeing right now is these two mics coming in as well as my two lavaliers. Let me just turn off the, uh, go to input. Let me just turn off the front mics for a second. And now you're just seeing You want to be careful with these to make sure that it looks like I've got it done right, but they're switched. So you just make sure when you're setting them up that you've got your first lavalier going to channel one, or in this case, three, and your second lavalier, so there's no confusion. I did notice that a little bit with these cables, that they've got a red marker on there, but it doesn't always seem to be correct from cable to cable. So sort of an afterthought by them, but the, otherwise the cables work great. Uh, the thing to do would be to get a second one for lavs. Oops, excuse me about the noise. Lavs three and four. If you have another pair like I do, just plug that into the other side. I'm using my lavs right now for this recording. But um, if you were to do that, you would simply plug the other transmitter, your second transmitter to the other side, like so. And your second pair of mics are going to come in on five and six. Okay. I hope that makes sense, guys. Those are my two, probably my two favorite cables uh, that I found on, on, online. And they really make it, they're compact. Uh, I'll share a little bit later in my gig bag. I have these come out and kind of clip onto the top so I can keep an eye on them. Plus they're not blocked uh, so there's no interference from the signals. And I'll have four different lav mics out on actors and a boom mic as well that I can boom and have record four different lavs. So it's my preferred method. If you wanted to do a wired uh, XLR boom, there's a way you can do that as well in addition to having uh, these four lavs. The problem is that I'm using all four of my XLR jacks for this configuration. So what I'm going to do next is show you how you can uh, reassign uh, two of your lavs to the front panel and that opens up two XLR jacks for one or even two booms. Okay. What you can do, I want to free up these two XLRs right here. So I'm going to take that cable out and put that over there. And this is where I want to plug in my uh, boom mics one or two boom mics over there. Uh, or sometimes what I'll do is I'll do a wired boom mic, the XLR, and then have, uh, I might still be using one of one side of my Rhodes for a wireless boom, because I've got my uh, Rode video mic uh, wireless, wirelessly transmitted back to this unit. So you can still leave this plugged in. You just don't unplug, you just leave uh, one side plugged in freeing up your other side for your boom. That way you've got two lavs, a wireless boom coming in on say channel six. Channel five is not gonna be uh, getting back to the unit, but I've still got an XLR open for uh, a wired boom. That's one way you can do it. Another way you can do it is just to pull that out entirely. And let's say I still wanted to have 
two lobs. I'm going to take off this adapter. And here's the trick that a lot of people are missing. Is that, let me turn on these. Uh, turn on the all. Uh, right now I've got all mics armed. Okay. So let me unscrew these. I've had no problems with un uh, attaching these while it's at, while it's hot. It pops for a second, but it doesn't seem to hurt anything. Put those aside, put those someplace safe. And what people don't always know about this unit is that, and I don't know why Tascam doesn't broadcast it a little bit more clearly, is that you can plug in your lavs. This is the road lav that comes with the uh, unit. With the, you can plug these straight into the front once you take those mics out. It works fine. Okay. There's no noise, it's clear, it's a good level. And you can do two of them. Oops, that's not a lob, this is a lob. Let's plug that into the other side. So this is great if you're just doing a, if you're near the unit, you don't need to worry about the, uh, the road stuff, I mean the, uh, the transmitters and receivers. You can just plug your lobs straight into the front of it, clip these on. This is a great for a podcast situation. You don't have to lug microphones all around and set up stands. You can just clip these right on your, your talent and your recording straight onto tracks one and two. And you can spread these. It looks like you can get them apart over a coffee table or a dining room table or two chairs sitting next to each other. It's a pretty good reach, you know, even with the, without any kind of extensions. Uh, so that's good if you're doing a short run. Now let's say that you wanted to do a wireless though. Um, obviously, you. These cables aren't very long. You, they, you need to get your, your transmitters and receivers going. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, what you do is instead of using that output right there, you go to the same cable I showed you earlier, this little guy. It serves two purposes. You do the transmitter output, stereo output, to the left and right inputs like that. Oops. Make sure they're in securely. Get these out of the way. And now you're in business. You've got with that cable, that's a stereo 3.5 to two mono 3.5s back into the front of your unit. Both of your mics are working just fine as you can see left and right. And those can go out on your different actors. The nice thing about these roads is that in addition to being uh, able to plug a lav into the front of it, uh, they've got a, a microphone built right into it. And you can just clip those on your shirt like that. And you're, you're broadcasting. It's like a clip on lav. Uh, the quality is pretty good. It's not it's probably going to be as good as your, uh, your lavalier microphone. Plus, they're kind of unsightly. I don't like seeing people clipping on like that. But if you're not on camera or it doesn't matter, you can just clip them on your shirt like that. They also come with a handy little uh, windscreen that you can snap on. The new windscreens are really nice too. They're much more secure. The other ones used to kind of fall off. You twist them and they're, they're, not, they're not going anywhere. So I've dropped these. Uh, uh, they take, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're crush proof, but they're really durable. The range on them is okay. It's not that the range is bad, it's that as soon as they're behind an actor or if somebody's on top of it or they're behind a building or a car, uh, you start getting some interference. But as, as, if you can see it, you can hear it and it's pr the range is pretty good. I've had people walk uh, 50 feet, 100 feet away and you can still, you can still catch that audio. Um, but there's nothing like a boom. You know, that's the thing about boom mics is you, you, you wire up your boom and um, you know you're not going to have to worry about interference. That's the nice thing about that is that, uh, so I like, I like using lobs on actors, um, but the boom is going to be the main, the main thing people are going to be hearing. Uh, the lobs are kind of for a backup in case some, you know, something happens. You can trust that boom. But here's, here's the way you can do that then. You can have two, two mics on your front pair. Another two mics, lavalier mics, on say five and six, coming in that way, like I showed you. That's going out to another transmitter. And then you've got two XLRs open 
for a boom or two. Uh, if you had a stereo boom, something I'm looking at, a stereo microphone uh, wired, this would be great too. You could put that stereo mic up on a, a boom pole and capture stereo sound wired into your Tascam. Something I'm looking at doing because I do a lot of a lot of concerts. Uh, maybe I don't want to have that on a boom. Maybe I just want to mount the uh, the stereo mic right in front of me. Or you could do uh, two two microphones into this as well. So for a uh, XLR stereo recording. Nice thing about that is you can uh, use that for powered. You can power a phantom powered microphone with that too. The one thing I will mention about this setup with the front mics, these two guys in front are not uh, phantom powered. There's no way you can get phantom power to go to those uh, front microphones. They're not powered. So that's kind of a bummer. I wish again that uh, instead of giving you those cheap microphones like that, uh, that they had just given you an extra couple of XLR inputs right in front. I mean, think, think of how nice that would be. And then you could attach whatever kind of microphone you wanted to. Uh, even if the Tascam wanted to make these like a little XLR switch, I don't know what they could, they could do something a lot better so that these are optional and you could plug in XLRs right in front with phantom power. That way, this device would really be amazing. If you had six XLR with phantom power preamps, um, that would blow away the competition. One of the nicest things about these, in addition to being used as uh, lav microphones, is that often what I'm doing uh, requires what's called a plant mic uh, when you're recording on a film set. Um, you'll have, say, a boom mic or two going, maybe a couple lavs, are using on the, the actors, but I always like having at least one or two of these uh, clipped on my sack on my sound bag, ready to go. I'll have them powered down, but I've already checked to make sure that as soon as I turn them on, I've done a sound check and they're recording. Uh, what that's handy for is if uh, obviously if another actor walks into the situation, I can quickly pop one off and lob, put a lob on that actor right away. Um, that's, that's always nice to have one or two ready just for that extra guy that walks onto set and all of a sudden he has a line and uh, you need to get him on, on uh, recording. Um, the other thing that these come in handy for is what I call plant mics. That is, it's, a, uh, it's not a mic that you hide in a plant. It's a, a, a mic that, you, although you could hide in a plant, it's a mic that you plant on something. Um, let's say that um, uh, somebody, f there was a stunt and somebody fell off the side of a, a building and you wanted to capture the sound of that crash, uh, something I did recently, you could um, put one of these mics, carefully put it where the stuntman's not gonna land on it. Uh, don't mount it on the stuntman either, that's gonna get crushed, but put it somewhere, hide it or plant it somewhere near where the impact is going to occur. Or you could even do a couple of them if you wanted to get that impact in stereo, you could do that too. Um, but put them out of harm's way. Uh, if something's gonna happen, there's uh, something drops on the floor, Put that back behind the counter to catch that sound. You can use these to record uh, sound effects, um, all that kind of extra stuff that, right? When you hand it off to your audio guy, they're like, oh man, that guy got that sound. I don't believe that. So you're not just getting the boom and the lobs, but you're also getting uh, the action around the actors. Um, if there's a car peeling out, you could put that you know, anywhere near that. Um, they're, not, they're very portable too. So if something's moving, if somebody's getting in a car and driving away, you could just quickly put that in the automobile or uh, uh, clip it onto the actor and you're gonna catch whatever uh, sound that car is making when it drives away. Whatever you're doing, these are great little plant mics. Uh, if you needed to for some reason, you could take off that windscreen and attach a lav and then it, you could uh, you know, plant that lav uh, someplace really hard to see. So if it's, if it's a closed shot and you, you, don't want to, you don't want to see this in the, uh, the shot. You could get that out of this off screen. And uh, you, you ask, ask the cameraman, ask the DP, hey, is that showing? Uh, is, is, the, is the mic showing? Um, is that reading? And you'll get a lot of respect from the camera guys if you ask if that's uh, reading on their camera. Then they can say, oh, this guy's thinking about me. He's not just putting his mics up anywhere or they're going to be in the shot. He's thinking about what we need, which is we don't want to see that mic. You can clip this very discreetly someplace, just off mic, just off the camera, and check your frame. I always ask this camera guys, can, I see, can you see that cord? Nope, can't see it, no, nope, it's out of shot, perfect. And that way, you can really hide these. The mics aren't too expensive. These are about 80 bucks each. There are cheaper lavs. You can get cheap, cheap lavs online for 20 or 30 bucks. Um, 
I wouldn't recommend them for dialogue, but if something happens to the mic, it's no big deal if it gets crushed uh, or dropped in the ocean. Um, having some cheap lobs around is always kind of nice not to worry about it. That way you can use them for plant mics and put them just about anywhere. Okay. And always have them handy, guys. Have them ready to go because things happen quickly on set and you, you don't want to be scrambling around through your sound bag trying to find an extra microphone when all, all you want to do is catch, capture the action real quick. And if it's ready to go, you're a lot more apt to use it. You say, hey, that, let me just drop, give me a second, I'm going to put a mic on that spot where that's going to happen. Somebody letting a cigarette, you know, something as simple as that. They don't have any lines, but they're letting a cigarette. Get that sound. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Do you understand? One of the other really nice things about these little uh, Rode mics, and this is not a video about Rode, this is about the Tascam, but since I'm using these so extensively, uh, sometimes I get the transmitter mixed up with the receivers, excuse me. But the two little transmitters, or microphones, transmit to this receiver. And uh, they, in addition to transmitting the signal back to your receiver that goes into your unit, they also have a safety record feature on them. Uh, anybody that's familiar with the road will know about it. Let me just explain that very briefly. Uh, in addition to the signal that's coming back to your camera or your recorder, uh, they are both actually two little standalone recorders and I believe they can record eight hours at 24 bit. I'm pretty sure I've got that right. I think you can get do longer than that if you go down to a lower sample rate, but at the full 24-bit wave file uh, so that if something happens and you say you get back to your editing suite and you find out that the um, there's a dropout there's some interference or it, some crackle or the actor was too far away and it dropped out anything like that happens and you lose your audio especially critical audio um, you've actually got a backup recording in each of those units, so everyone has its own little recorder of what's happening on that live, mi live mic uh, anytime that the camera was on. That is, anytime you hit record on your camera, it starts recording on that unit. All you have to do to recover that audio, if you need to, is download the Rode app onto your computer. I'm not sure if there's one for uh, mobile devices yet. I think they're working on that, but uh, I downloaded the app. I think it's called Rode Central. Uh, it's a free app that you can put on your computer and then all you need to do is uh, open that app and then you just use a little USB cable, uh, USB-C, into your, uh, you plug it into your um, microphone, your transmitter, and plug the other end into your computer, whatever kind of USB connector you have. And the computer will basically lock onto that through the Rode app. If you have the Rode app launched, it will... Um, see that device and then you can go through the steps to download all that audio. So it's really wonderful. Uh, it's like having a little secret weapon. Um, you can also set these up so they record on their own. So if you just wanted to have a little recording going on, you could set it up in the Rode app so that they don't wait for the camera to turn on. You can just, anytime that the microphone is turned on, it's recording which is kind of cool. Uh, you could do a lot of damage with it too if you're not careful, but <laughs> Uh, you can set these up so they're just, they're just little portable recorders and anywhere you go with a little windscreen you just um, turn that on and it's recording even if it's not going back to your camera uh, then you can go home later and you could have as many of these as you want recording and just set them around and then later in the day go home and download the information into your computer uh, that's another way you can do it. I don't do that too often, but that's a possibility. But mainly I just wanted to show you the ability to recover that audio in case something happens to your, uh, your onboard um, recordings. The wireless boom that I use, basically I'm using my boom mic right now, although I can, uh, I can undo this for a second. It's not gonna hurt anything. It might make a little noise here. So here's my, here's my boom. This was mounted, obviously, out of the shot. That's how simple that is. This is the uh, Rode uh, Video Mic NTG. And I love this little mic. It's got um, some roll-offs, uh, a minus 20 pad, 
It's got a feature there in the middle that you can press that button to get to those. Minus 20. Or this feature is a safety feature that since this is only uh, mono uh, recording, it doesn't need a stereo file. It records on the left side, it records the full volume. And on the right side, it records the same data, but at a lower, I think it's 10 decibels down. So that if something did happen loud on your microphone that distorted, you could use the other side and recover that way. Um, I don't use that so much anymore now that I'm recording 32-bit. There's no need, obviously. And then the best thing about this mic, besides it's got a really good sound quality, is the um, volume knob right there. No need to go into your, uh, your Rode mic settings, your Rode transmitter settings, and adjust the volume there. You can just do it right at your fingertips, which is really nice for dialing in uh, sound. And you can get a little wind, I think a windscreen comes with it. Uh, there's also a little fur dead cat uh, that I've got you can put on here that's totally worth it. Got to have that. I don't have a blimp for this mic. If I'm going to do a blimp, I'm going to go with my, um, my more professional setup back there. So this is, this is obviously going to be mounted on a boom. I can show you real quick. Actually, I can't show you real quick because I'm using the... Uh, actually, I can. I can show you real quick. I can do everything real quick. But this is the shock mount that comes with it. And that just clips on like so. Just press it in. Okay. This side for a second. And that's your... You're basically ready to mount that. Take off this adapter. This is the little road boom pole that I got. I think it was about, I don't remember how much it costs. And you just untwist it, unlock it, and you can get pretty long. I don't know if you can see that or not. But I'm able to get way back in the corner there. I think this is a seven foot pole, if I'm not mistaken. And you don't have to use it at full, full length. It's not the greatest, but it's, it, it was cheap and very lightweight. One thing I found is that the locking mechanisms do tend to break after a while, so it's not, not too pretty. What this nice little contraption has that you might have missed is um, the ability to slide the... Um, slide it back and forth if you're mounted to your camera. This is a lightweight mic that can be mounted onto your camera. That's light enough that it's not going to break off. Although I, I still don't like doing that. I have a cage on my video camera, but you can do that if you don't have a cage. It's, it's lightweight enough that you could mount that right to the top. Or you could also mount it to that cold shoe I showed you. Okay, like that. And there's other ways you can do that with a handle and whatnot. I don't usually do that. I'm more apt to just keep that free. And then the nice thing about this, oops, sorry, is that on that little sliding thing on the bottom, there's actually a little cold shoe. It doesn't look like a cold shoe, but actually it's perfect, the perfect size for that. And I found that, I was like, wow, that's perfect. And then you can cable, you can cable manage this through there. There's little clips. I don't know if you can see or not. But there's little clips inside there to clip your cable down even. You don't really need to with these red cables. They're very stiff and they hold their position nicely. But you can wrap that through there and get that cable pretty tight. And once you've got the, the mic on, by the way, the mic will turn on when you turn on the power to your transmitter. That's one nice thing, thing about it. When you've got the mic set up like you want it, and you can see all your dials and stuff, if you want to do a roll off, now is the time. I don't do that because I do that in post. Just make sure the mic is on and you've got access to the, uh, the volume. And then once it's all set like that, you can mount it right to your boom pole. Get on in there. There. And that's my boom, that's my wireless boom pole setup. You can tighten the top and the bottom knobs. You'll snug. Put on a windsock if you wanted a dead cat. 
that is wirelessly transmitting back to your, uh, your, your receiver. And that, of course, plugs in to there. The receiver does have to plug in, of course. And that goes, this goes back in your sound, your sound bag. Okay, or if you had a lav going as well, you could, that, lav, that other lav is gonna be coming back on channel six. You see? Hope that makes sense. But that's a really nice way to just do a basic interview. You've got a lav on the actor or the talent, and then you've got a boom uh, as well that you can go overhead and get that on him or mount that to a microphone stand. That's another thing I'll do. If you don't have a boom, a C stand and a boom uh, fishing pole holder like I do, you can just use any, any mic stand. Just a regular studio mic stand. You can mount that on there. And uh, you would, what I usually do is lose this, uh, but you can, you, can, you can figure it out. There's ways you can mount that right on there. Or you can just lose the, uh, this whole contraption, the shock mount. Get rid of that and just use a regular mic clip, a narrow mic clip. Just bring that in like that. And then you can put this over your, the head of your actor so that you don't have to have a boom operator all day and then just clip that on any way you can. What I'll usually do is just clip it right on the, the mic clip like that. I'll actually use a piece of gaffer's tape around there and just clip it to the, the gaffer's tape or you can rubber band that on there, whatever you want to do. Uh, and then just put that over your, get that boom up just out of the shot like that. See, they gotta watch that. <laughs> or you can just wrap it around. It's stiff enough to do that. You see, I like that, that's fine too. And then just put that over, over the top, angle it in a little bit towards facing your actor's throat or chest, right in here, not so much the mouth, but right in here. And once you've got a, the angle right, look at your camera monitor and just take it on up until it's just out of, out of screen. See, it's right, you can, you can touch it with your fingertips and see it's right there. You see, there she is. And if it's, in, if it's in the shot a little bit like that, you can just crop in a little teeny bit. But I always try to make sure it's out of frame, especially on um, film productions. You don't want your boom mic in the shot. You'll get major grief for that. <laughs> But they'll tell you, they'll say the boom's in the shot. And uh, sometimes they'll say, uh, if you can't get it, if it's causing a shadow or something coming in from the top, they'll come in from the bottom, they'll have me come in from the bottom. Or sometimes you can't get, can't get a boom shot at all. Then you gotta look, look at plant, you gotta work with plant mics and uh, lobs and stuff like that. But anyway, that's another, another boom mic thing. Um, so you've got a boom coming in on one and you've got your lob coming in on two. Right onto, right onto your task cam. So that's the uh, overhead boom and lav situation that I like to use wirelessly. Uh, there's no, no cables involved here except for this little guy. And this of course goes in your boom bag. Another beautiful day in Hawaii. Still can't see the uh, mountain for the clouds, but it is a sunny and yet overcast day. We get that in Hawaii a lot. It'll be sunny and then it'll rain for 10 minutes and then it'll get sunny like this again. Just beautiful here. If you're ever here to visit, uh, look me up. I'm in Hilo, right on Kilauea Avenue. If you're in town, uh, I'll give you my address. You can come by and check out the studio. Talk story, have some coffee. All right, there's one thing I mentioned earlier that I wanted to show you. Uh, I told you how much I don't like the browse feature in the launcher, um, but sometimes when you're in the field, it's necessary for you to play back a file. So like I said, what I'll do is reach for a speaker like that. And where's my favorite cable? There she is. Let's hook that up again. Headphone out. To my speaker's input. Super easy to set up. Say the producer or the 
DP or the, you know, I want to check out a file or play it back if I heard a noise, some street traffic. And I said, hey guys, I think there's some bad noise in the background because they want to they want to move forward. They're always moving forward. The crew, I might I might call attention to something and say, hey, can you give me another take on that? Uh, I've got a bad traffic noise in the background. Something they might have overlooked. But it's your guy, your job as a sound guy to to point that out to them. Otherwise, it'll blow the take. Uh, they'd have to go to uh, uh, ADR or something like that. Um, so if you if you got a problem, speak up. Uh, try not to speak up all the time. You don't want to be a pain in the butt. But if you do have a problem, do speak up and say, hey, check this out. I've got a, can we do that again? I've got a, a noise issue or, a, you know, a crackle in the microphone, whatever happened, call attention to it. Don't try to pretend it didn't happen and cover up because it will come to the service later and they'll remember that. Um, just be forthright about it. And if they don't believe you and say, no, I think it's okay, uh, you might want to say, well, you want to listen back and check it out. Yeah, okay, we'll take a second to do that. They might not. They want to, might want to move forward, in which case you just got to go with the flow. But if they do, you've got to give them a quick playback. And uh, I don't want to go into the browser like I showed you. That's a pain. So what I will do is go and just... Uh, the last take that you recorded is usually still fresh in the memory. So you really don't have to go to the browser. All you have to do is press play. And it will go to that file and play it back. Okay, isn't that nice? So, let me show you again. If you're in your manual mode, you go to your input. It doesn't matter which of these screens you're in. You can play it from the mixer or wherever. Just hit, hit the play button. You can even do a little mix on the fly if you want. But that's my point, is that that's the really the easiest way to play that back, okay? If you're in the home position and you hit that, you have the ability to skip forward and backward like I showed you before between takes. There's not really any kind of scrub feature. But you, can, you don't have to go to the browser, you see? I don't know why they want you to go to the browser. This way it doesn't have to load up every time and you can just play it back real quick. Turn it up if you need. You got plenty of volume there on that little speaker now. Okay, and then I'm gonna do. I wish I could do like a. Maybe we'll do like a house. You see? Rolling, rolling. Okay. I'm gonna come over and touch the battery, and it game. Rolling, rolling. Go through. Your, go through your takes that way real quickly. You good, John? Rolling. Okay, speeding. You can pause it for a second if you need. Remember, if you need to go back to the beginning, hit it once. If you need to go back to the previous one again, hit it twice. You'll get the feel for it. I'm gonna come over and touch the battery. It shows you what track or tracks are playing. And it doesn't matter which of those windows you're in. Mixer, you can do that if you wanna do. Bring down, do, you know, if one's really too loud, you could bring down that one mic and bring up the other if you need it. Who's on fire extinguishers? Uh, pause that. But if, in the home feature, you get that skipping. You can skip around. You can also go to the top there. I don't know if you can see, and move it that way, just like you can in the browser. It's the same function. Uh, the only thing, again, I wish they had, is that that volume knob. Is not doing anything. It would be so nice if you could just use that to scrub through, especially if it could, you could hear the scrub. That would be a really pro feature that would allow you to kind of fast forward through it until you got to the spot you wanted. I'd love to see that integration in the future. The volume knob is not doing anything at all. Uh, and there's no need to go into browse like I showed you. That's your best way. Just remember, all you have to, there's no play button on the screen. Just hit play. It takes you right to your file. Game on. Okay. Game on. Okay. Let's wait for this to cover up. Ready? Coming. Hold on, Jonah. Ready? You like that framing, Jonah? You should frame me somebody, man. I know I'm going to. Who's on fire extinguishers? I got your line out to your left. Yeah, we had fire extinguishers that day. Hmm, something's going on in Hilo. 
I'm going to take a minute to go over the uh, inputs and the mixer function here. We've touched on it a little bit, uh, but of the th three screens, um, the main one you're going to be using is the input. Um, there's other videos online about how to use this, so I won't go into too much depth, but I will show you uh, the basics of it. This is really where things happen right here when you're in the field. When you're recording, uh, you might consider kicking back over to home uh, so you don't inadvertently uh, bump a level. That's one thing I, I might suggest is that while you're recording, you might want to kick it back over just so you don't grab a fader by mistake. But when you're setting it up, you've got all six of your tracks. You've got uh, uh, VUs at the top. Uh, you have these little guys that you can adjust with your finger. These are the uh, input gains in decibels. And, and then you can also control those, trim those, fine tune those with the uh, volume knob. Okay. Uh, so you can grab it, move it up or down, whoops, back, and then adjust it with this. Uh, the nice thing about 32-bit folk is you don't have to worry about some, that so much anymore. It, it defaults to 18 plus 18 decibels, and I, that seems like a really good place just to kind of leave it parked. Uh, and you usually don't have to change it. Um, remember, this is 32-bit floats, so it doesn't have to be dialed in so carefully. Uh, as long as you're getting a decent signal, it's not really, really low or really, really hot, uh, you're good, you know, um, if you want to adjust that a little bit. But you really don't have to worry about it so much, guys. It took me a while to realize I don't have to think about I was always fidgeting with the, the volume level. Uh, you don't have to do that anymore. Get a good level and glance at it and then go. Anyway, that's how you do that. You go, you click those, they'll put a little blue light around it and that's, that's how you know it's selected. Uh, there's nothing else at the top. There's some little um, peak hold meters there that you can engage if you want it to stay there. Otherwise, they'll just stay on for a second. Uh, below that, you've got the, um, this is important. Uh, I should show you first the uh, on off features. So. These are, this arms the track, or the tracks, and you can do any combination of that. If you're not using, uh, if you're just recording one or two mics, or a lav and a mic, for example, I wouldn't recommend leaving everything on. It's just going to record uh, empty information and take up memory, okay? Uh, there's an exception to that if you're recording in the field, uh, just to keep uh, lavalier mics consistent from actor to actor, you might want to just go ahead and record silence on all those tracks. That way, if one actor is not there, uh, they can see that. Uh, I won't go too much into that right now, but um, sometimes when I'm recording in the field, I'll just leave all six tracks engaged and hand those files off like that. It takes up a lot more memory, but it's much more clear to the editor, because uh, every time you take turn off a track, it bumps the next track up, so track four will become track three and, and so forth. So that's how you arm and disarm your channels. Once you've armed your tracks, and let's say you wanted to turn on some phantom power or make some kind of adjustment like that. Right between the, the two buttons there are these little microphone guys. And those are not on off. Those are just selectors. So you select channel one and it's going to pop up the input settings. Uh, that's also available in the general settings, but uh, this is the best place to do it right here. You don't have to go back to the browser and all that. Just hit input settings on that microphone. Uh, you can do it a stereo link if you want to link that pair of microphones, one and two. Like for the front mics, you might want to link those if you're just doing a, a music recording or something like that. You've got a nice stereo pair up front or any, any of combinations. Uh, turn it off for double mono. Auto gain, if you're doing a conference or something like that, you can turn that on and that'll, that'll take care of that for you. I don't, use, I don't use auto gain very often at all. Uh, low cut filter, if you wanted to engage that, you've got the ability to do that right here. 40, 80, 120, 220 hertz. I would recommend, if you're using it at all, either do 40 or 80 hertz. I wouldn't kick it up to 120 or higher. You're going to lose low end information on pretty much everything. 40 is safe. 80 is about as high as I would go. You can do that in post anyway, so I don't know why you're bothering with it here. I, I usually don't use roll-off filters. I want to capture as much information in the field as I can and then sort it out in post. Uh, below that, you can slide down. You do have a noise gate. If you wanted to turn on a noise gate, low, medium, or high, I suppose you could. Again, it's going back to post-production, so you can take out that stuff there. This way, you're not going to clip off anything inadvertently if you leave it off. Below that, you have a limiter and a comp. 
you can select that there or there. If you're doing 24-bit recording still for some reason, uh, you might want to engage that. Uh, a little compression on your vocals or a limiter to keep things from getting out of hand if there's loud noises. But if you're recording 32-bit, you don't have to worry about that anymore. And I would leave that off. Uh, if you need to phase invert uh, a mic on a pair of mics, you can do that right there. Oh, I skipped. Um, oh, there's a, also a solo feature right there to solo the mic. Let me show you one little thing I forgot. Uh, if you want to solo a track, just touch the... Uh, Touch the uh, top part of the screen there. It's a nice little hidden feature. So when you're listening to, say, six microphones coming in, six actors or whatever, uh, if you wanted to just solo one actor and check out his, his microphone, just do it right there. There's no need to go into the uh, submenu there. Uh, that just shows you that it's on. Down below limiter comp, you've got EQ settings. You've got uh, some presets, voice, guitar, loud, and vocal. I'm not sure what loud is. I guess that's loud noises. Uh, those are presets that automatically put on a, a preset EQ uh, if you don't want to do that yourself. What's easily overlooked here is um, right one click below. If you just slide down, you've got what I like to use. I don't know why it's not up at the top, but the manual. And you, turn, you click that and you've got an actually a pretty usable uh, digital EQ here. It's got a basic low and high shelving as well as a, a, a parametric uh, low, mid, and high, mid in the middle uh, that you can, if you wanted to EQ your input mic uh, or uh, if you've got, a say, a PA system plugged into it from a DJ and it's too much bass coming in, it's distorted, you know, something like that, you could roll off low end right there. Um, I don't usually do that. I usually just record the microphones flat, but it's nice to know that I've got it right there. I just wish it was the top so you didn't have to go down through that menu. I think a lot of people overlook it because it's hidden. Anyway, I'll just usually leave that off. Um, you've got a nice big volume fader right here. If, not a fader, excuse me. You've got a nice big uh, gain right here. If you wanted to adjust your microphone with a little bit larger uh, screen, you could, and you can use that knob again to do that. When it's active, you'll see a, a video display right there. Uh, what's nice from this window is you don't have to go back out to switch to another channel. Once you're in a channel, uh, up at the top, you can switch between the different uh, inputs, uh, one through six, and adjust pairs. Um, the most important thing that you're probably gonna be doing here, and you can't do it on channel one and two for some reason. They've got it set up just for those unpowered mics. Uh, big oversight, by the way. Uh, they should have allowed you to add phantom power on here. That way you could plug in uh, uh, phantom power requiring microphones to the front. But they've disabled that feature on one and two. If you go to three, you'll see, um, Right at the top, you'll see Phantom Power. You see right there. And you can kick on Phantom Power to three, four, five, or six. It'll ask you, are you sure? So you can not, it'll, you know, if you want to not damage ribbon microphones or something like that, it gives you a little warning. You hit yes, and it's going to power that microphone. And you can just switch over to five and six if you wanted to turn on a bunch of stuff. Uh, again, one and two do not have Phantom Power. Three, four, five, and six all have Phantom Power. All the other features are active. One little thing I will tell you about the um, stereo pairing, it's kind of nice, is that if you, if you wanted to pair, say, uh, two microphones, XLR microphones on three and four, you could stereo link them. Uh, and then uh, if you wanted to have phantom power on just one of them, it does allow you to do that. It's, uh, it's kind of a little detail that you probably won't use, but you can turn on phantom power on both of them or neither of them or just one of them. And every time it'll, it'll give you a warning before you turn it on. So that's kind of a nice little feature. I, I can't think of an application that I would do that for with a stereo pair, grouped stereo pair. Um, so it's there if you need it. Oh, I'm sorry, there's one more little feature. Uh, low and high input gain. Uh, if you had a really low signal, you could just, instead, you could just crank it up and get a, a high input gain. It gives you a higher volume, okay? You should get good at this window. This is probably where you're going to be spending most of your time. The other feature on the other side of this is the mixer. Um, as I mentioned, I don't do too much mixing in the field. Uh, I'm going to go back to my studio and do any kind of a mix right there or any kind of editing. So I don't use the, uh, the mixer on board too much. What I usually do is just set up all my faders and make sure they're all at zero. 
across the board, or at least close to it. All right, and right above it, you've got some panning controls, left and right, and you've got, you select it, and then you can either dial it left with your finger to move that channel left or right or wherever, say hard left, and then on channel two, you could put that hard right. So if you had a music coming in on, on one and two, a stereo file, uh, if you wanted to spread that hard left and right, you could do that. That's really the only thing I'll do. I don't usually play around with any actors, lavs, mics, or panning with that. But if you have a, a stereo file or two, a music file playing back, uh, you, could, you could do that there. Uh, again, I usually just use the, use the uh, center position. Uh, this is one of the places where you can use the middle dial. That's your mixer. So you can adjust uh, faders. You can also adjust the fader trim with the volume knob. Okay, but I'll leave, this, leave all those at zero, leave everything centered. You can solo here too on playback. That's a nice little feature if you just wanted to hear one channel. On, if you're listening back to a file, you can do it from the mixer. About the master at the top, you have a master output volume. If that's going out to a PA system, this is where you adjust that level going out if you needed to. Uh, you can also adjust that so it gives you a mono output if you're going to a mono source or something like that. At one big monitor, you could you could blend the stereo, all the stereo images, if there were any, into a mono. I just I don't mess with that either. I leave that off. The home function is the uh, the main screen, uh, and from there, like I said, that's the only way to get back to your settings menus, uh, which I'm trying to avoid doing. As I'm showing you some of these ways to navigate your signal, your flow here, I'm trying to avoid going to this screen at all costs. Uh, I don't like it there unless I'm setting up my, uh, my unit or something like that. Of course, you gotta go there to get to the launcher, but um, honestly, I'm never going to the launcher anyway. I'm always leaving it in that manual mode. I'm not using my browser. I'm not using any of my presets. Uh, I've found, uh, incidentally, I checked on the um, podcast, and as you can see, they're, they're playing just fine from here. But when I unplug that, they're not playing through that little speaker. And my little speaker is not broken. I, the little internal speaker, I checked it. Uh, it's not broken. Uh, for some reason, there's a glitch. I checked to make sure that my speaker is turned on. Maybe that's, maybe it's not supposed to go out that little speaker. Maybe they've got that just set up so it's going out uh, your external line out. Maybe that's an intentional oversight. But then you plug in your headphones and you can hear it, which is odd. So I don't spend too much time in the podcast. I just wanted to show you that little thing right there in case you're trying to play it back without an external speaker or your headphones. Like I said, I'm gonna just recommend you stay with manual mode to cut right to the chase. Let's avoid all the presets and novice stuff like that and just get really good at dialing in your, um, your input and using your playback features in your mixer and from the home button. That's where you want to spend all your time between these three guys and mainly those two guys. As I mentioned, when you're recording, I'll show you with the other mic. These little mics are handy, I gotta say. Just being able to clip them on and not have to deal with a cable or anything is kind of nice. I just wish they were better quality. I was looking at some of the Zoom microphones and man, they, they sure are nice. Zoom gave you such a nice selection of mics. Tascam should follow suit and allow you to nice little solid XLR clips on the front here that you could attach decent quality mics. And like I said, if Tascam isn't going to make the microphones, they should, they should partner with a company like Rode or uh, Shure, anybody that's making microphones. And uh, they could even do some boutique microphones up there and really make some money, you know, if they partnered with Neumann or something like that. Uh, imagine that, if they had Neumann microphones on the front of that. That would change the game. But uh, what I was going to tell you is that when you've got some signal coming in like that and you're recording, the only indicator is this little red dot right there. I stop, it goes white. So there's a little indicator right there and then of course you've got the red indicator on the back which is your main record light right there. You can see that, right? So, the nice thing about going to the home screen is the whole thing goes red. You can see clearly that that is 
Gray is not doing anything. It's just you're monitoring your level. Red, you're rolling, and you can see the timer roll. Or if you're playing back a file, it goes green, and I'll show you the timer. Once you've got your input settings set up, hop over to the home screen, and you'll see clearly that it's recording or not. And also, you're not going to inadvertently uh, bump a fader or change a volume level or something, okay? So, there you have it. Get good at it. And keep those set at 18, plus 18 decibels. You should be good in most situations. I just wanted to show you the different uh, setups you can use. Uh, I'm off mic right now because I don't have my lav on because I wanted to show you here, but I'm sure one of these mics is picking me up pretty good. I've got a bunch going. Um, channel one, this is my Deity shotgun microphone that I just picked up uh, for my main boom mic. I used to use my Rode as my principal mic, uh, but um, it, it works great. I just wanted something uh, XLR and a little bit more professional. The Deity came in at a really good price point, uh, less than some of the uh, com competition. So that's my main uh, boom mic. Uh, I usually have that obviously on a boom pole, and I have a new boom pole too. I got a nice, nice long nine foot boom pole. Uh, and I still have my Rode uh, 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 video mic here. I think this is the NTG uh, video mic. I've gotten a lot of good use out of that. That's wonderful. I like it because it has a little volume knob right on the end there. You can plug, plug that in straight into your camera. Uh, the way I've got it usually is wireless. So I can put that on a boom pole, uh, a second boom pole, and give it to another guy, and he can go do a second boom wireless, which is really nice. Um, that goes to Rode 3, uh, as does my first lav that's on road four and those transmit to this little guy right here the receiver and that's plugged into as i showed you earlier that's plugged into my front jacks one and two so i've got my um my road uh video mic on one and my first lavalier on channel two and then my um xlr boom is coming in on three on four I've got uh, uh, just a, you can use any kind of mic here. I just brought out this uh, vocal mic. Uh, it's a good announcer's mic. Uh, it takes phantom power. Uh, and as I described earlier, it's nothing fancy. It's just a, a kind of a cheap MXL mic, but I found that they really sound great. And I'm not too worried about it in the field if something should happen to it. I'm not bringing in a studio microphone. Uh, so it's something to get damaged. I could if it's critical. But usually in the field, uh, a large diaphragm microphone is plenty for announcers, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and then next to that, I've got uh, on th uh, five and six, I've got uh, my two, two more, my second and my third lav, as I described earlier. Uh, five and six are coming in on transmitted uh, and coming in on the receiver there, five and six. And I've got my lav there, and like I showed you, my little plant mic there is ready to go. Or you can use that for a clip-on mic as well, which I can do right now probably, huh? And clip that on, and I'm, I'm picking up audio nice and clean. Let me just show you how good that works. Let's clip that on right there. and I'm, I'm getting a broadcast audio right there with little fuss or muss. On my external input, I've got just my uh, iPhone plugged in there. Uh, this is music application, so I'm set to pl play any kind of music I want straight in and record that. Uh, if I had the remote control, I could obviously operate the Tascam from the remote control the Tascam provides, but I don't have that chip yet. Something I'm probably going to do anyway. Um, and then a um, pair of head headphones plugged in. I'm not using the external output jack. I could easily do that by plugging that in here. And that could go out to a PA system or something like that. On the other side, I've got my USB battery plugged in, as you can see. Or if you are inside and near a power support, support you can just unplug that and it'll still record. It's not going to stop recording because it's kicking over to those batteries for a second. That's the nice thing about this. And I'll just kick that right in there. Actually, I'm going to try that just to show you. Let me record. And as you can see, it's recording. Now I'm going to unplug that USB power. Kicked over to battery. And it's still recording. I can hot swap it with my USB. 
if I was switching uh, from indoors to outdoors or something like that. And it's still recording. Isn't that nice? No need to stop recording. Just let it roll. And then I can unplug that. I can pretty much do whatever I want in terms of plugging stuff in and out on the power. And let's just say I came back inside. Let's plug that back in there. All right, and we're back on USB power uh, from the AC. Brilliant. Yeah, I think I mentioned earlier, if you turn up, you can turn your headphones up and down right here, but your output, your external output going to the public address system, the PA system is unaffected by that. So you're able to turn your, your headphones up and down as you like and not affect what the PA is doing. Okay. So in this respect, the Tascam really shines. Uh, the ability to get ins and outs going, uh, they really did a great job. And you gotta consider the price point. Again, folks, it's about 400 bucks as opposed to seven or eight or nine or a thousand or 1800. Uh, you can clearly do a lot with this. Uh, this is about as maxed out as you're gonna get. I can't think of any other inputs that I'm not using. Every little hole is accounted for on this little baby. Uh, I can't think of anything I missed. I know there's a lot of cables and connectors here and it's all a bit overwhelming. The good news is that it's not that much money to get all these and make your port capture all it really can be. Most of them will also work with other field recorders as well, not just Tascam. So if you'd like me to send you a list with all the exact item numbers, just click the link below so I can email it to you directly. Mahalo as always for watching and I appreciate the interest and support. Aloha from Hilo, Hawaii. Shoots, brah!